life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife. 265, 265 in our hymnal. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure. to the rock which cannot move, ground and firm and deep in the Savior's love. It is safely moored, twill the storm withstand, for it is well secured by the Savior's hand. Though the tempest rage and the wild winds blow, not an angry Shall our bark or flow? We have an anchor that takes the song, steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock which cannot move, ground and firm and deep in the Savior's love. When our eyes behold through the gap, storms all pass forever more. We have an anchor that keeps the soul stand fast and sure while the billows roll. Which cannot move ground and firm and deep in the same Please remain standing as we pray. This morning, Evangelist Randy Starr will come and lead us as we get started. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the labor that has gone into having this meeting from the pastor, the staff, and this church. We're grateful for it. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will speak to hearts in every message. Lord, I pray that you allow us to have tender hearts to hear what the Spirit's saying to us through the Word. And we pray your power upon every speaker. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. All right, a few things that we'll want to run over as far as we'll do some announcements at the end of the service, and that's helpful. Um, we had a great start last night at the Sustainers Banquet, and uh, if if you uh, are a sustainer uh, of the college and you weren't able to make it in, we do have a, a gift for you, so stop by the front desk. Uh, we appreciate you sustaining uh, the college, and it uh, helps us in benefiting uh, the students here uh, with scholarships and keeping our tuition low, so we appreciate you guys. Uh, welcome to a bunch of teenagers that came in yesterday, uh, some maybe even this morning, uh, visiting for about a day and a half, some of you, but we welcome you. Uh, for our college days, and hopefully you enjoyed um, some activity last night if you were there. I know they went uh, skating and classes this morning, and um, that's always just exciting right there. It's really exciting, um, and it's very normal. That's why we do this at college days. It's very normal. Uh, usually every week we go skating. Uh, then we have uh, <laughs> different things because you're training for ministry. You're training for ministry, so we just try to keep it normal. Uh, this afternoon, we'll be golfing for uh, hours. <laughs> right, the pastoral program. All right, so, uh, but we appreciate you guys coming. We have uh, some events scheduled for this afternoon, and we'll uh, give you some information. The teenagers, a lot of you, uh, right afterwards, we'll have uh, Eric Ramos go through and help you out with that. As far as uh, the guest, um, and this is, uh, even church members, if you want to um, 
follow along or come along on these things. Shirley Starr is going to be speaking to the ladies at 1 p.m. in the College Chapel. And then at 1 p.m., there's a pastor's uh, panel, a panel discussion on Bible-related topics. And that's going to be held in the library, in the upper library. And that, again, is for uh, the pastor's panel, any men. And you don't have to necessarily be a pastor uh, to come up and sit and partake in that. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion. We have kind of some pre-done things as far as questions, but that may spur a question for somebody sitting out in the, uh, in the crowd, you know, saying, hey, we're going to talk about different things with the Bible, uh, even cover uh, maybe a couple of uh, controversial things. And I have uh, a panel of guys that we, we uh, sent them some things ahead of time so that they can at least be thinking on it. And so, again, 1 p.m., upstairs in the upper library that's a uh, panel discussion on bible related topics for uh, pastors uh, any men that would be interested in that then uh, Shirley Starr will be speaking to the ladies at 1 p.m. in the college chapel okay and I think uh, all the other things we're gonna uh, talk about at the end if you if you want to grab your uh, song books the offertory this morning is hymn number 62, hymn number 62, crown him with many crowns. And there's uh, some verses that kind of go along with that in Psalm uh, 47. It says this, for God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. The princes of the people are gathered together, even the people of the God of Abraham for the shields of the earth belong unto God. He is greatly exalted. And then uh, a couple of other verses uh, in Revelation. Revelation chapter 5 and verse uh, 13 says this. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And one other passage is found in Psalm, or in Revelation 19, of verse 12. It says, uh, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And uh, I found this interesting. Ushers, if you want to make your way down while I read this, Spurgeon preached a sermon on that passage uh, on, on his head were many crowns. And this is what he said. He says it better than I can. He says, all well you know what head this was. And you have not forgar forgotten its marvelous history. A head which once in infancy reclined upon the bosom of a woman. A head which was meekly bowed in obedience to a carpenter. A head which became in after years a fountain of water and a reservoir of tears. A head which sweat as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. A head which was spit upon, whose hair was plucked. A head which at the last, in the grim agony of death, crowned with thorns, gave utterance to the terrible death shriek, Lama Sabachthani. A head which afterwards slept in the grave. And glory be unto him that liveth and was dead, but is alive forevermore. A head which afterwards rose again from the tomb, looked with radiant eyes of love upon the holy woman waiting at the sepulcher. This is the head whereof John speaks in the word of the text. Who would have thought that a head, the visage of which was more marred than that of any other man, a head which suffered more than more from the tempest of heavenward of earth than ever mortal brow before, should now be surrounded with these many diadems, these star-bestudded crowns? Hopefully, as Stringhaven plays, we'll think about those words, crown him with many crowns. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless our meeting together this morning, fill the speaker with power. I pray that our offerings would go to you and worship to you. He who is crowned with many crowns, according to the Bible. We thank you for Christ and what he means to us as saved people. And I pray that we would ever, in our hearts, be in awe of you coming and dying for us, Lord, sinful people, so that we can have uh, a part in heaven. We can partake and we can be heirs together. I thank you, Lord, for salvation. 
bless the remainder of the service, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Number 175 in our hymnal will stand again as we sing, Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. 175 in our hymnal. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, God by Savior, standing. Standing on the promises I cannot fill, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. We're starting the conference with Pastor Teach Moore, and I uh, love Pastor Moore, and I get along a little bit with his wife, uh, Debbie. That's why I've been telling her it's why we're having the ladies' session this afternoon. Um, Mrs. Starr, make sure she doesn't take over, all right? Um, she's threatening that. In fact, when I went to pick her up yesterday, I left my wife back because I told her I didn't want the influence on my wife. <laughs> Oh, uh, if she could get up here, oh, uh, she would she would slam me. All right, she she is gifted that way, so we have a good time bantering back and forth. But Pastor Moore was saved later in life. I asked him to share a little bit about that. Um, I love salvation testimonies, and I love how God can reach down and find people, and that's what that's the amazing salvation that we have. And so uh, both he and his wife lived out east. Uh, and uh, we're working. Uh, he was working out east and got saved uh, a little later in life. And then he went, uh, once he got saved, uh, he was married and um, God called him to preach. And so he moved his family and went to Bible college. And he's been serving the Lord in various capacities, uh, pastoring uh, a couple of different places. But uh, recently, 
and Capital Baptist Church in Dover, Delaware, and he's been there since 2007 uh, as the pastor. And Pastor Moore um, is a, just a solid Bible uh, man. He, he knows the Bible, loves the Bible, and he loves studying it. And so when I was thinking of equipped in the word, he was one man that I thought of because he just has a, a love uh, for God's word and desires uh, to, to express that and pass that on to others. And so I'm excited that he could be with us this week. Thank you. Pastor Cameron. And uh, yes, it is a joy to be here today and to be a part of this conference. And uh, uh, I want to thank... Uh, Pastor Damron and uh, Fairhaven Baptist Church and Fairhaven Baptist College. Uh, this is my third time out here and uh, always, always been treated like a king, you know, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, just the hospitality is over the top and uh, I enjoyed uh, just meeting a lot of new folks. Uh, I was familiar with Fairhaven back when we first got saved and I'll share a little bit about that with you here in a moment. Uh, I was reading, I think, one of the periodicals that you all sent out. The Fundamentalist was with Fairhaven. Uh, I forget what it was, but I was reading that early in my Christian life. Uh, I was a bus director and reading about your bus ministry and all that, so got a lot of things uh, from that. But I had never been able to get out here until probably the last uh, few years, and it's just been a joy uh, to be here. And uh, I say that I stand here by the grace of God. Amen. Um, my wife and myself... Uh, did not grow up in a Christian home, Christian homes. Uh, her parents were not saved, and uh, my parents were not saved. And uh, through a series of events, uh, God was stirring in our hearts. I was uh, graduated high school in 1981 and uh, went to secular college because I was a lost man, didn't know what to do with my life, and uh, went for two years to Widener College and then noticed that uh, there was an industry that was opening, uh, opening up uh, in New Jersey, it opened up in 1978, and that was the gaming industry. They call it gaming, but it's really not gaming, it's gambling, uh, it, the casino business. And uh, I saw some opportunity there in my mind. I thought, well, I could get a good job and maybe work that as a career and have a wife and all that and chase the American nightmare. <laughs> and so I did. I chased the nightmare. And... Uh, through a series of events, of course, I worked my way for many years there at the casino because so, I got involved with that. Uh, I was actually not old enough to gamble, but I was old enough to work there. That's just the way the rules worked. And uh, at any rate, uh, we raised, we had three kids, wonderful children, and, uh, and some events happened in my life. And then the big one was when my father had passed away out of kind of suddenly, and it really shook us, you know, just... For me, my mother was from France, and my father was adopted, so we had no extended relatives, so dealing with death was something that me as a, an individual didn't deal a lot with, and he died suddenly and stirred a lot of questions in our hearts, and uh, long story short, we knew that my dad had, although we had both gone to church before and sometimes with the kids here and there, um, we decided to try a Baptist church. Uh, because it was close by, we heard that um, uh, my dad was... Grew, grew up Baptist, and so we, we, were, we didn't know what to expect, and this is a good lesson, I think, for all of us, especially for me. You know, when people come into our churches, they don't understand a lot of things, and uh, we didn't understand a lot of things either. We didn't know what to expect. All we knew about what was, was what was on the television you saw with Baptist churches, so we were a little uh, hesitant, uh, not knowing we'd see a bunch of people in robes clapping their hands and dancing around us, you know. But uh, that was not the case. As a matter of fact, the church we went into was a church that I passed every day going to work, and I didn't care about it because I wasn't saved. And so it was an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing King James Baptist Church. And so we attended probably a couple services there, and uh, we were listening to the, the sermons as they were being preached, and uh, we didn't understand things. We knew we were, we were, long story short, we were like fruit falling off the tree, if you will. We had so many questions about our soul. And uh, we heard things that we didn't understand. We heard words we didn't understand. We, we, the message, even though it probably was as clear as a bell, because of the blinders that have been on for so many years, it, we didn't understand it. And so we probably, we actually came forward at one of the services and knelt and prayed and, and didn't know what else to do. And so we went home and, 
did that at least one week, maybe two. And as we looked in the bulletin, um, we heard the announcements. We heard uh, the preacher talk about visitation. And uh, he said, yeah, we have Tuesday night visitation. So, you know, we didn't know what that was. We thought that was when people come in and ask questions to the pastor. So we had the idea, me and my wife, that uh, we'd go to visitation. <laughs> and we did. We showed up for visitation, two lost people. And um, I think if our story, my story's right, we called and uh, told them we were coming for visitation. They must have thought, what in the world is this guy uh, you know, coming for visitation? So anyway, we, we went in and we uh, talked to the assistant pastor, Pastor Howard Bird. And uh, he brought us in a room, and uh, he asked us the question. He said, uh, you know, for sure, if you die, you go to heaven. And uh, we said, at least I thought, I don't remember the exact words, but my thoughts were, this is exactly what we're trying to figure out. Amen. And so he took the Bible, and he showed us both the scriptures, how we were sinners, and you didn't have to convince us of that. And we were on our way to hell, and that what Jesus Christ did for us. And that night, both me and my wife, on a rainy Tuesday night in 1996, bowed our heads and trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. And um, it, uh, life has been totally changed for us. Um, that summer, um, we, uh, I was called into the ministry, believe it or not. I remember my pastor saying, uh, at that time, he says, you need to learn the Bible. That's what you need. And I felt, always felt in my life, always, because I got saved. I was 32. My kids were, um, my youngest kid was two at the time, my, my son Jared. And uh, I've always felt that I was playing catch up, you know, because people knew things I didn't know. And so I always felt like we had to work a little harder to understand things from the Word of God. But um, by His grace, uh, we were able to be led out of the casinos. And uh, of course, our families, they're very, kind to us. I think many of you that come from first generation Christians understand that it can be rough at times, uh, but they were very kind. Um, some got saved, uh, others not. We're still praying for them uh, many, many years later now, and, uh, but we are grateful for it, you know, and uh, we heard words, and I'm going to get to the Bible here in a moment. Uh, we heard words that, uh, again, like invitation, you know, and what is that? We're going to have an invitation. I'm thinking, how do you have an invitation, you know? The preacher told us to do your devotions, you know. I said, what is a devotion? How do you do a devotion? I mean, you, you know, you, I didn't get all that, you know. And so be compassionate to people. I think there's, there's a zillion people like me and my wife out there that uh, are not necessarily rejectors of God. We were not. We just didn't know. Nobody ever told us. And uh, we are so grateful for Pastor Bird. He's in heaven now. And uh, that he... Uh, he took that step to ask us about our soul, you know, because for years, no man cared for my soul. That's how I felt. Been to churches, never heard the good news, never heard Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, praise the Lord. So, so why am I here to, this morning? I don't know. You ask Pastor Dameron. I don't know. I am here. I'm just asking God to use me today. It's great to meet some good people. I'll tell you this, though. I feel so comfortable here uh, in that... Uh, the stand on the Bible and separation and standards. I believe you can preach the truth and do it in love, and we'll talk about that this morning, hopefully, if I get to the message here. So, But thank you for having me. I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Jonah, chapter 3. Now, don't tune me out when I say Jonah, because I know you've heard many messages probably from Jonah. But Jonah, chapter 3. We want to read here in a moment. Begin reading in verse 1. Jonah chapter 3. I do think it's safe to assume in a crowd like this that you are familiar with the book of Jonah. But please entertain me for a moment as I make a few comments about chapters 1 and 2. If we were to outline chapters 1 and 2, we could do it easily and perhaps we could say a six-point outline if you want. We could say in Jonah chapter 1 that Jonah is recruited. God came to his prophet named Jonah, who was already a servant of, him, by the way, of his, by the way. He was a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. We find his name not only here in the book of Jonah, but in one other place in the Bible. 
And that is 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25. And imagine for a moment, here is this man, Jonah, a prophet, a man serving God, about the year 824 B.C. under the reign of King Jeroboam II. And God asked him to do something, and you know the story, just let me review it for a moment here, that uh, Jonah was recruited by God, but secondly, Jonah rebelled. Jonah said to God, I'm not going. I hope there's none of us like that here today, but if we were all honest about it, we are like that at times to some degree. Jonah rebels and he heads down to Joppa. He gets on a ship that's heading in the exact opposite direction. You know, uh, Nineveh was about, oh, as far as it is from here to Dover, Delaware, from Israel. You ever wonder why he stayed? Why didn't he just stay? He was about 800 miles away. Why didn't he just stay? I'll tell you why I think he didn't just stay. It's because of human nature. You see, when you and I know we're in rebellion against God, the last thing we want to be reminded of is God. And staying in the land and seeing the people, hearing those greetings, shalom, peace be unto you, walking by Abraham's sepulcher and all the reminders of God was the last thing he wanted. And so he did something that I'll call, if you don't mind me using the word, stupid. He had the idea he was going to flee from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah rebels. By the way, God responded after that. There's your third point. And he always does to a rebellious child of God. Don't get the idea that if you and I rebel against the Lord, if we're a child of his, according to Hebrews chapter 12, he's coming after us. And he did so with Jonah. It's kind of interesting how he did. We could call it a four-phase attention getters, if you will. We see the calamity of the storm. God sent that storm in verse 4. Uh, that didn't work. Jonah stayed asleep on that ship. Then we see the confer, uh, confrontation of the shipmaster there in verse 6 where he confronts him. What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. Jonah's still hard-hearted. Then we see the casting of the lots. They'll say, we'll figure who, the, who this is all about. Let's cast lots to find out why this is happening. And the lot fell upon Jonah. And once again, Jonah did not rise up right, right yet and say, it's me, it's me. No, he just kept his mouth closed until he was cornered by the sailors. They surrounded him in verses 8 and 9 which causes, finally, Jonah to repent. He was right there, I believe, as he's cornered. And by the way, that's the way God works with us. I, I think so. He sends one thing after another until he finally corners us and causes us to come face to face with our sin. And Jonah dies. You say, are you reading the right Bible? I am. I mean metaphorically. He died for a moment here. We know what happens in chapter 4 to his self-will. And that's what God wants for all of us, by the way. And so Jonah repents and then Jonah returns, if you will. He turns to God. And remember, Jonah says this, cast me over. Understand, Jonah had no idea God prepared a fish. We do. We read chapter 2. We understand all that. But Jonah said, I'm done. If I have to die, I'll die. Lord, whatever you want in my life, I'll do. And that's what God wants out of all of us. And we know that uh, Jonah returns back because God prepares a fish there. We understand that in verse 17. And you know the story. He's three days and three nights in that fish. And then perhaps we could say the last point of this six points outline would be this. The fish regurgitates. Out comes Jonah. Now a changed man, for, for now I should say. And he's going to make a beeline to Nineveh. 
Notice verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went into Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them. And he did it not. Amazing story. Let's pray. Father, I need thee this morning. Lord, we need thee. We are so grateful for this conference that is emphasizing, Lord, what needs to be emphasized, the Word of God. Lord, I pray as I come before thee as a needy preacher, Lord, that you'd please fill me afresh and anew with thy spirit. Lord, all of us in this room recognize the challenges ahead for us, the challenges we face. Please, I pray you'd use this message to equip us in the word. Help me lead and direct my thoughts and words. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, throughout the history of America, there has been several spiritual revivals that have taken place. We could think about a lot. The Great Awakening, the first one. I'll mention the second one here in a moment. I think of Shubal Stearns and the separate Baptist revival and the church planting revival that took place. What an amazing thing. Uh, Shubal Stearns and Daniel Marshall, after he was saved under the preaching of George Whitfield, headed south, eventually ended up in North Carolina and started a church in Sandy Creek and preachers were trained, people were saved, churches were planted literally by the thousands uh, uh, in extension, if you will. What an amazing thing. That's why the Bible Belt is there, by the way, if you're wondering. But we've seen many great moves, movings of God in America. We'll call it revival. I'll mention a little bit more about that. When speaking of revival, Charles Finney put it best. I believe when he, when he defined revival this way in his 1830s books, Lectures on Revival of Religion, he said this, A revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. I like that. Many people have many different definitions, but I think that's what it is. One of the revivals that took place in America is known as the Second Great Awakening, 1800-1840. During the Second Great Awakening, uh, one of the preachers, of course, was Charles Finney. And it's it's amazing because, of course, we're in the Northeast. uh, And Charles Finney, uh, Whitfield, they all preached through those areas. Uh, We're not in New England, of course. We're in the mid-Atlantic states. But still, Charles Finney did preach in Wilmington and head up north and preach there. Uh, And again, when he preached in 1831 in Rochester, New York, uh, he he saw an unparalleled, and we're told by the records, hard to believe if you think about it, 100,000 people saved. It's amazing. But can I say this, that that is nothing compared to what we read in Jonah chapter 3? What we find in Jonah chapter 3, I believe, is a high point of this remarkable story. More miraculous than the three days and three nights in the belly of the whale is what happened in the city of Nineveh afterwards. It was the greatest and most thorough revival that has ever taken place. It is the greatest mass conversion you're looking at here in history. Never again has the world seen anything quite like the result of Jonah's preaching in Nineveh. 
I understand there'll be a great a turning to God in revival during the tribulation, but up to this point, this is amazing. So I want to challenge us this morning and ask this. The great question. How did it happen? Don't you want to know? I do. When I see this great moving of God, I want to study it. I want to look at it. I want to consider it. Uh, and we're going to talk about that this morning. I want to preach this morning on the subject, the key to revival. What is the key? We all want it. I think all of us would agree that America is in deep trouble. Oh, you may be sitting here this morning thinking, wait a minute, preacher, I understand with the last administration we could say that, but we're doing a lot better now. Are we? We're not. I don't know about what's going on in Indiana, but I do know what's going on in Delaware. Mind you, the Joe Biden state. <laughs> Throw the tomatoes later. I mean, when men marry men and it's called normal? When we're teaching our children now that they can choose their own gender? When marijuana is becoming, recreational marijuana is becoming legal? When we are harboring, even defending criminals that are here as illegal aliens? When we are now killing a full-term baby on the day of its birth? Who would have ever thought in America that a socialist could run for president and get an ear? And get a following? We're in trouble. And I know who I'm speaking to this morning. I think we understand what the solution is. The solution is not a political solution. Right. It is not an economic solution. It is not an educational solution. It is not an environmental solution. The solution to America's problems is a spiritual solution. Right. Amen. Are you with me this morning by saying the only answer for America is revival. Amen. America must turn back to God. We're all familiar with 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and for, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. There it is. And, and I understand, uh, if I understand revival right, that revival does begin with God's people. And that's where we are today. That's who we are today. But today I'd like for us to consider the, the one key element for revival. Uh, not the only element, but certainly a necessary one. And in my opinion, the most important one. You say, what is that? It is a faithful preaching of the word of God. It's that simple. Notice Jonah chapter 3 and verse 2. Uh, Jonah is said, uh, told by God once again, by the way, thank God for second chances. And third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Notice, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. I believe it is only when God's churches uh, get back to the faithful preaching of the word of God that we have any chance of seeing revival. Amen. That's it. It's that simple. Let's consider, first of all, number one, the place Jonah went. Notice where he goes, the place. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. I mean, after that whole ordeal in chapter 1 and 2, Jonah finally obeys God. He finally enters into the city of Nineveh, and we read that Nineveh was, notice, an exceeding great city. That's not the first time God mentioned it. Notice in chapter 1 and verse 2, he describes it the same way. That great city, chapter 3 and verse 2. That great city, chapter 3 and verse 3. Again, he talks about a great city, exceeding great city. And I want to ask, what was so great about it? 
You know, their greatness had nothing to do with their goodness. Not at all. I believe the exceeding great comment that we find uh, in those verses could at least apply, uh, uh, if not in direct interpretation, uh, by application could apply to several things. First of all, they were great in size. It's a big place. The capital of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Oh, it it wasn't always the capital. Asher was the first one. But Nineveh just grew and grew and grew till it finally became the, the capital of the most powerful government in the known world. It's the oldest and most populous city of the ancient Assyrian Empire. It was located on the east bank of the Tigris River, just uh, uh, in the north section of the Assyrian Empire. It is in what is today known as modern-day Iraq. Uh, It was a big city for its day, about 60 miles in circumference, much larger than ancient Babylon. Often when we think of ancient history, we think of the great Babylon. May I say Assyria was greater in my opinion. And Nineveh a shadowed Babylon, which would come in the future. They had two city walls that went around them, much like Babylon, 100 feet high. Imagine that. They could ride a three chariots across them side by side. Walls had 1,500 towers. Think of that. I can't imagine that. I checked that because I said, That's, that sounds impossible. 1,500, 200 feet high. For its day, Nineveh was great in size. Uh, According to what we read in Jonah, uh, chapter 3 and verse 3, it would have taken a person three days to walk from one end of the city to the other. It's big. It was also great in splendor. It was one of those cities you'd walk into and your eyes couldn't stop moving. I mean, the glimmer and the glitter and all that they had was was amazing. They had accumulated from their conquest conquest, great uh, wealth, uh, great extravagance, great luxury and splendor. They gathered stockpiles of gold and silver and precious metal from all of their conquests. Buildings were amazing, the temples were amazing, the palaces were amazing, the marble sculptures were amazing, the decorative bricks on everything. They had the world's finest botanic gardens, which would become the inspiration of the Babylonian hanging gardens. It's a beautiful place to look at. So it was great in size, it was great in splendor, but I think more importantly it was great in sin. Nineveh was a city of great vice. It would be one of those cities that you fear walking into. One of those cities that you would not want to raise a family in. I mean, great vice, great wickedness. The Assyrians were known for their sins, their ruthlessness, and their evil behavior. One commentator wrote, The entire history of Assyria is filled with a reign of violence. Terror, torture, and killing of conquered peoples. They pridefully carried home the parts of their enemies' leaders' bodies as souvenirs of war. The king of Nineveh would usually bring the severed head of a recently conquered king home, raise it on a pole in the midst of his royal banquet, commemorating his victory. He would then take that head and place it over the gate of Nineveh where it would slowly rot away amongst all the conquered leaders of those that they conquered. Imagine what that looked like. My point is this. Nineveh would have been a place that that you and I would have looked at and said in our flesh, there's no way God could do anything there. We would look at it and say, well, they're too far gone. There's no hope for Nineveh. There's no way that those people, those people are going to turn to God. Kind of like the way many of us view America today. By the way, if you view America that way, I'm sad for you. It's not good to be a hopeless Christian. You know, we have this group that call themselves a remnant Christianity, and I'm not saying everyone that calls themselves that is wrong, but uh, the ones I know of, they have this idea, us four and no more, God's done working, there'll never be revival again, and let's just hang on till Jesus comes. That's how you'd view Nineveh. 
But can I remind us all this morning that Genesis 18, 4, uh, the question that is asked, uh, is there anything too hard for the Lord? I think we know the answer to that. The answer is absolutely no. There is no place uh, on this earth that is unreachable. There is no person that is too far gone. As long as there is life, there's hope. Do you remember, hold your hand here and turn with me over to Ezekiel chapter 37. Do you remember this was the exact thing that God was trying to show Ezekiel? In the valley of dry bones, notice verse 1, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out into the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones. Can you imagine Ezekiel's face? What's all that? A bunch of dead bones. Uh, There's no good. There's no life there. Why am I here? Verse 2, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? You know the answer. Natural mind would say, no. They're dead. It's gone. It's too far gone. There's nothing we can do. And that's right, humanly. And I, answered, uh, and I answered, oh, Lord God, thou knowest. That was a good answer. I'm not going, I'm not going to try answering that one. Lord, you know. I, again, he said uh, uh, unto me, notice, what's he to do? Prophesy upon these bones uh, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. Amen. And we know the story. He prophesied to them, and what happened? Uh, that valley of dry bones that everybody looked at and said, nothing can happen here, they're too far gone. God did the miraculous, amen. amen. He brought life to it in a place that no one expected. So we see the place that Jonah went. Notice, secondly, back to Jonah 3, the preaching Jonah did. What is it going to take for us to make a difference for God in our, in our nation. Well, verse 4, it's very simple. And Jonah began to enter into, uh, into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Remember what God said to him in verse 2, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it. The preaching I bid thee, and Jonah did so. He went in and he cried out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Did you notice what Jonah didn't do? He didn't go in and survey the people, what kind of church they wanted to have. He he didn't go around and uh, uh, try to do things to attract a crowd. Can you imagine that? He didn't go there and try to entertain them. He did not try to uh, go there and establish his uh, relationships with people. He didn't go and ask them, what kind of preaching would you like today? He simply went into this city, this wicked, evil city, and he preached God's message. It was that simple. I know I'm guilty of simplicity this morning, but it's really not that hard. Notice two things about uh, Jonah's preaching. Number one, it was simple preaching. It wasn't difficult. You know, Jonah's message was eight English words. Uh, Even in the Hebrew, it's five words. But notice these words were as clear as a bell. There was no ambiguity to Jonah's message. There was no wondering what Jonah was trying to say. There was no mincing of words. Jonah's preaching was clear and simple. Why do we think we need more? You know, this is the very same thing that the Apostle Paul did. Hold your hand here. Go to 1 Corinthians uh, Corinthians chapter 2. He went to a similar place. Perhaps we could call this the Nineveh of the New Testament, and that is the city of Corinth. Corinth was a very similar, evil, wicked. uh, To live an evil life, they would say, you're living like a Corinthian. 
What did he say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1? And I, brethren, when I came to you, notice, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Amen. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That's exactly what we need today. Amen. Simple, clear Bible preaching. So notice it was not only simple preaching. Jonah's preaching was also scriptural preaching. Do you know his message wasn't, wasn't his message. It was God's message. God said, here's my message. I want you to simply take my message and deliver it to the people of Nineveh. Jonah didn't have to come up with his own ideas. Uh, uh, he didn't have to water down the message, uh, not at all. Uh, he delivered them the word of God. And I'm thankful that's what God wants. Because to be honest, I'm not a very creative person. <laughs> I'm not. Coming up with these neat ideas for sermons and neat things like that and these neat illustrations and all that, I'm not very good at that. But I'll tell you what, it's easy for all of us if we just simply just preach the book. And just preach what God says, make it uh, scriptural. Did you know that it required great courage for Jonah to do that? And it will if we're going to be Bible preachers. If we are going to deliver a simple scriptural message, clear as a bell, not mincing words, understand it's going to take courage. Amen. We cannot, as they say, tiptoe through the tithers. And sometimes, by the way, you, people face a threatening audience. I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I'm sure every preacher in this room that has for some time had somebody in, the, uh, in your membership or in your auditorium that just didn't like you. And he didn't like your message. And week after week, you have to preach to someone who's sitting in the pew pretty much like this. With the face. That can be intimidating. It took great courage for him. Uh, but what are we told to do? 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 and 2. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing and in his kingdom. What are we to do? Preach the word. Be instant in season. Here the apostle Paul is telling uh, this young Timothy, his son in the faith. Look, here's what I want you to do as a young man. Uh, don't mince words. You get in there and you simply preach the word of God. Amen. By the way, the time will come. Should we say has come right. when they will not endure sound doctrine? But they're looking for teachers. Having right itching ears, right? Tickling the ears. God deliver us from that. Do you know what is needed more than anything else in our churches today is that very thing? Simple, scriptural preaching. Can I ask you something? Why are we afraid to preach the truth? I understand you have two ends of the spectrum because there's some guys that want to preach the truth. They want to rip off everybody's head while doing it. I don't think that's right. But I don't want to go to the other end while we're so soft that we compromise the truth. Hey, I believe, I really believe you can preach the truth and preach the truth in love and still have standards, still take the right stand on everything we stand for. I believe it's possible. So what are we afraid of? Why are we afraid to mention standards? I'm talking about specific things. Why are we afraid to, to talk about right and wrong music? Why are we afraid to, to name out sin? Why are we afraid to touch the dress issue? If it's Bible, it's Bible. It wasn't just Bible 50 years ago. It's still Bible today. See, this is the ingredient that's missing. By the way, there's churches all around that will accommodate people's lifestyle. But God help us not to be one of them. Right. We need the preaching, simple preaching of the Word of God. So we see the place Jonah went. Number two, the preaching Jonah did. And then thirdly, notice the power God displayed. It's amazing what happens. <laughs> you say eight words? He must have said them a lot. Probably did. 
Hey, he probably did. He probably went through that city repeating that same message yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. This is probably a good time to interject this. Uh, you know, we need to repeat things again and again. Sometimes we get into a church that we take and we go through the whole thing of why we're Baptists, why we believe the King James Bible, right and wrong music, and then we depart from it never to be touched again. We need to go back again and again and again every couple of years and preach on these things again. But notice the result of Jonah's preaching was absolutely incredible. So the people of Nineveh, verse 5, believed God and proclaimed a fast. And put sackcloth on, put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh. And he rose from his throne and he laid his robe from him covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be pro proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, Who is this? This is the king of Nineveh. You mean the word of God can do that in the hearts of people? Yes! All of us are here today because of the work the Word of God has done in our lives. Amen. But imagine here, uh, and we see that uh, in verse 9, they ask the question, who can tell if God will turn and repent? They didn't understand the, uh, the, the false gods. They wouldn't forgive them, but God would, and He did in verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. Two million people turn to God. Should I say two million Ninevites turn to God. The king himself orders this uh, citywide uh, fast. He, 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 he covers himself in, in sackcloth and ashes uh, and this entire city, imagine, that's what the Bible says, the entire city turned to God. I still believe that when the word of God is preached, God can still work in people's hearts. Have we forgotten Hebrews 4.12? For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, uh, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Don't we still believe that? 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for we, uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Don't we believe that? Don't we believe that the word of God can take the minds of the people that are liberal and thinking ungodly things and turn them around? Don't we believe that? It can bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what the Bible says. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You see, if we, we never, if we don't get back, or at least stay, and I don't know where you are, to preaching the Word of God, line upon line, simple, scriptural, precept upon precept, and stop doing foolish things to try to attract people, to try to entertain people, to try to meet the needs of people, I remember when I first took the church in Oxford, and uh, it was a small church. They had gone through a lot of, lot of, lot of troubles there, and uh, I was voted in. There were 13 people there, and the day I was voted in, one left. That's encouraging. <laughs> so there were 12. We spent our years there doing what I think everyone ought to do, is knock on doors, try to reach people, disciple people, just simply fulfill the Great Commission. There were times that we had families come in, pretty big families come in, and they'd visit us, and they'd look around, you know, when it's kind of a smaller church, and it, the auditorium was pretty nice size. It could fit probably about 150. So you put 12 people in 150 auditorium. People walk in, here's what they say. What happened here? And so I'd go. My wife and I would go out and we'd meet with families, sometimes big families. And, and often, here's the question we got. By the way, young man going in the ministry, be prepared for these types of things. They asked, what do you have for us? What do you have to offer us? I don't know what they were thinking. I, uh, I honestly, I, I think they were thinking, what programs do you have? Do you, do you have a church softball team? Do you have go golf outings? Do you go roller skating? 
Oops, shouldn't have said that one. I'm just kidding. They wanted to know. And uh, you know what my answer was? And I wasn't being smart with them. I said, we have the Bible. Amen. And I said to them, do you know the greatest thing you can give to your children is the truth. Don't bring them to some place where they're getting entertained into the gills and they don't hear one shred of truth. What the best thing you can do for them, for their lives, for their future, for your grandchildren, is to give them the truth, the word of God. But you know what happened many times? They'd say, oh, sorry. You're not for us. But that's the answer. Folks, churches are going out of control today. Again, I'm not saying to, that you, you don't give someone a gift. We gave gifts out for Resurrection Sunday and things like that. But understand, it's, it's not a substitution for the Word of God. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. You don't do that instead. And so many churches are doing everything imaginable to get a crowd, but they are missing the one thing that is necessary if you want to see God work and move in the lives of people, and that is the teaching and preaching of the Word of God. Do you know it's a key element of every revival? It's a key element. The preaching of the Bible. But you know what that means for we preachers? It takes work. It takes work. You guys come in to pastor a church. You try producing Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I'm not complaining about it. I love it. I am grateful to God for it. But I'll tell you what it takes. It takes study. It takes work. If you're going to deliver a Bible message, it takes work. You can get up there and just throw a few things out there. And, and you know, people probably just walk away as if nothing happened. But you know what you're doing? You're doing an injustice to your people. Because it is the word of God that's going to build them. You see, the problem is, is we're looking for microwave churches instead of crockpot churches. <laughs> it's true. Especially young guys, they want to come in, they want instant crowds, instant this, instant that. What do I have to do? And if it's not growing as they think, they think I have to do something different. You do not. A stronger church is a crockpot church. That week after week, they're built in the word of God and you have a strong membership and they're rooted by their convictions. Not by entertainment. Well, I got to stop here, but let me just say this. When I came to uh, Capitol, we're in our 13th year at Capitol. Great people, love the Lord. I uh, saw the pastor's pl place where his office was. And... Um, I noticed a sign on the door when I walked in there for the first time. Now, he had left, and he was a great man of God, and Pastor Fowler was there 38 years, and Pastor Jeffco was there two and a half years. But the plate on the door said this, Pastors Study. You don't see that anymore much. You know why? Because... The pastorate, in many, many ways, has become more like a CEO position than a spiritual shepherd that cares more about building people than building a ministry. Be careful. We're, we should be in this thing to build people, not a ministry. And what the key ingredient is, is the faithful teaching and preaching of the Word of God. That simple. The question is, will we determine in our hearts with all the craziness that's going on around us to stick with the Bible and trust that God's word works and get back to having faith in this book? It works if we work it. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness. And I pray this morning as we consider this key ingredient to revival, the word of God, that you'd help everyone in this place be committed to it. To those that teach it, to be faithful to teaching and study. To those that are preachers in this room, that we get back to studying and working hard and giving people something that's going to help their souls. 
And Lord, trusting that your word, whether we see revival or not, works. So we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed.